Hello everybody and thanks for joining me for a quick chat on The Stone That Never Came Down by John Bruner. Um, this is the most recent book that I finished and following this chat I will actually uh, touch briefly on what I'm currently reading as well as, as I've done in my last few videos, um, do a drawing uh, that will allow the randomness of the universe to choose my next read for me. Um, so yeah, but The Stone That Never Came Down by John Bruner, um, this work was originally published back in 1973. This is British science fiction um, and then my understanding is that it went out of print for a while and then it was picked up by Open Road Integrated Media and they put out an electronic edition in 2014 um, and that is the edition that I read so um, John Bruner um, I had heard of him I've heard of him in relation to Hugo. Uh, he won a Hugo Award in 1968 for Stand on Zanzibar. I read up a little bit on, on him um, and his years of life were 1934 to 1995 and my understanding from what I could read up on him was his popularity before the end of his life um, had sort of started to wane and um, so by the, before the end of his life actually um, Quite, most of his works were already out of print, so I think this might have been out of print for quite some time. But another interesting fact I discovered about John Brenner was that um, he um, is credited with coming up with the term worm um, as it relates to a computer virus. Um, this term was used in the book The Shockwave Writer in, uh, that uh, was published in 1975. Um, so yeah, I thought that was kind of interesting, but why I wanted to read this was it's sort of picking up a thread from last year. Um, I wanted to, when I was uh, curating my must-read list for 2017, I wanted to get another work of classic or, or vintage science fiction um, in this year for sure. Last year I had read Roadside Picnic by the uh, Strugatsky Brothers, which is Soviet-era uh, science fiction, uh, also published in 1973. And then I heard um, the, this book reviewed on uh, the channel Final Joe Blow, and Joe uh, did a nice review of this, and um, it, it really sort of piqued my interest, and I thought I would also give, I would just give this a try from my must-read, um, my must-read vintage sci-fi work uh, for this year. I would like to keep chipping away at some of these vintage works from the uh, 60s and 70s, especially those that um, have been out of print and now are starting to appear in, in uh, other forms, including in electronic editions. So, um, yeah, so that's why I chose to read it. Um, you know, it turned out to be uh, it turned out to be pretty relevant to today. Um, it takes it's a dystopian sort of story. It takes place in a near future dystopian Britain. Um, there is um, a large amount of of income inequality as well as economic insecurity among the population. The government seems to be corrupt and also um, maybe unable to keep the like the for example the streetlights can't stay on. The government seems to be struggling to be able to provide services. Um, so the government has a certain level of um, in, sort of ineptitude, I guess. And then um, there's also a um, there is a religious sort of conservative backlash among a lot of the population, a Christian one, where um, there's a morals crusade and this um, this sort of um, uh, political force, really, of a of a politicized, uh, really conservative. Christian religious fundamentalism has a lot of power. Um, the adherents can sometimes be violent. Um, they are called godheads. Um, and then this all takes place in a Europe of the a Europe that is uh, also facing a lot of turmoil and um, a potential uh, war to break out. Actually, over the common market, they call it. The common market is what used to be uh, what the European Union used to be called and so this really had shades of Brexit although it's not Britain um, that is threatening to pull out of the common market in this work um, but um, nevertheless there is uh, that sort of uh, backdrop uh, going on and then what ends up happening is a group of scientists come up with a a uh, biologic we would call it today I think that in the book they call it a replicant which is um, a biologic uh, engineer, biologically engineered organism. Um, it's sort of is sort of like maybe a virus. And when this is in when this is taken, 
are acquired, it can actually be spread um, once it's once someone is in, in, has been infected with it. Um, it um, it it enhances a person's uh, mental ability. Uh, basically, what it does is it it allows the brain to function um, as it or bring to consciousness a lot of what is currently. Um, out of consciousness, like uh, memories, uh, connections, the brain is able to form connections, um, able to like read fast, um, basically be able to uh, absorb a lot of data and information, um, as well as enhance the senses like eyesight, taste, smell, touch. Um, and so this is um, what is going on. Um, the scientists, um, this um, this organism or this uh, compound um, escapes the lab um, in a in sort of a limited way, and then there is a moral dilemma about how to proceed with it among the people who um, who know about it. Um, so I won't give away a lot else because it would be this book would be sort of a spoiler thing. Um, but that just sets it up to let you know sort of what the conflict is. The conflicts are, I should say. This book is sort of a, I would say it's a social uh, science fiction because it touches on social social problems um, like race, racism, anti-immigrant uh, because the I mentioned about the religious fundamentalism, the Christian religious fundamentalism. There's also an anti-immigrant sort of component to that, especially um, the immigrants who are um, from other um, seen as taking jobs away from British people, and as well as um, other religions like Hindus, Jews, and um, Muslims. And so um, there's a social component. So there's that. There's also a political component. Uh, so they're part of the story. Part of this is, I would say, a political science fiction. And then definitely it's got philosophical elements because there is a moral dilemma, a big moral dilemma of what you would do if you were faced with this. Um, you you have access to this um, this uh, component that I mentioned, this replicant, this this biologic that would enhance you. Um, would you take it and would you spread it? Um, and if, if you consider that a good, so that's sort of the dilemma, you know, that, that the book, the, the dilemmas that the, the book explores. And I found it all very, you know, sort of relevant to today because, um, not just Brexit, uh, although that was part of it, but, you know, just the politics, um, the politics and the social situation that, um, that it seems to be present here in the U.S. Uh, today as well echoes some of these themes of economic inequality. Uh, there's been a conservative backlash against um, a lot of things. Um, the religious conservatives, you know, of course. Um, so... Um, there's, um, you know, I, I found it, you know, very relevant. Another thing I didn't mention is about um, gays. So there's actually a, um, there's a gay character in this, in this story, and um, as well as persecution of, of gays uh, by the, the, you know, the conservative, religious conservative um, backlash that, that's mentioned, that's talked about in the book. So this was all, you know, from 1973. So this is, um, um, you know, I thought pretty, pretty relevant to today still. Um, yeah, but the other thing it really reminded me of, or that I, one of the reasons why I really enjoyed it, was this whole systems thing. Because once um, people um, have have taken this biologic, they are able to, like I said, they're able to see connections and things. This changes their level of empathy, but they're able to see a bigger picture. They're able to see the world as systems, and so they're able to see, for example, where a g given set of trend, where a trend may end up. So they're able to stop it. Um, but this idea was explored in a couple of other works that I read um, fairly recently. One from last year. Let me just pull it up for you uh, because I just kept going back to the scene you know, and saying, oh, this sounds like the Dervish House. This sounds like the Dervish House. So I read last year um, this book called The Dervish House by Ian McDonald. This also... Um, looks at the world as system and um as systems and in this case um it's it's based on nanotechnology and this is also a near future set in istanbul um i love this work too but this explores this idea as well of 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 changing your worldview instead of um sort of an individualistic um 
just you um, isolated uh, individuals into a sort of a macro, a systems kind of look at things. And then the other place uh, recently where this was discussed was Homo Deus. In Homo Deus, this is a work of futurism, which I've talked about a number of times on my channel. Um, and I read last uh, earlier this year, um, this talks about, they call this uh, look at systems dataism. And this is looking at the world as systems. Um, and so you would look at yourself as part of a system and how you contribute to a system or how you're impacting a system. Um, so, yeah, that's, I, I, you know, I thought of both of these works as I was reading it because this, while um, the stone that never came down is from 1973, so it's much earlier, um, our idea of data and systems hadn't evolved yet because we hadn't had the internet information explosion quite yet. Um, but still, it's there in the stone that never came down as well in a certain form. Uh, and I, I really enjoyed, I really enjoyed uh, that. And I enjoyed making that connection with the Dervish House and, and Homo Deus. Um, yeah, so I mentioned about the relevance. Um, I, you know, it's, it's, you know, I, I know it's, it's, it's sometimes it's 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 us constructing a narrative when we read an old work especially of science fiction 1973 is a long time in the science fiction world because it deals usually with science and technology which over especially the last 40 uh, some odd years has moved for fairly quickly and so a lot of classic works I guess you know become out date become dated and, and feel dated when you read them um, but this one you know just felt relevant on lots of different levels even though they might call things uh, by different terms than we ended up calling them they don't have things like they never reference the internet or cell phones but stuff like that is um, beside the point really when it comes to a, you know the big picture and so I just found it really uh, you know really enjoyable and relevant to today Day, and I hope to also continue this um, this trend of, or continue my my chipping away at this these uh, reading these classic works from the um, from the mid 20th century 1960s and 1970s especially so I've got some more coming up uh, even this fall I'm hoping to get to another read from the Strugatskys which would came out in in the 1970s in the Soviet Union in Russia then the Soviet Union. So yeah, what I'm reading now, let's move on to that. I'm going to leave the chat at that and just chat for a bit about what I'm reading, or at least just mention it. I'm reading uh, The Lectures and Sayings of Musonius Rufus, who was a Stoic Roman Stoic philosopher, one of the big four. Um, Musonius Rufus was Epictetus' teacher. I'm actually almost finished with this. I should finish with this probably either today tonight or tomorrow for sure. Um, the trans I'm reading this translation by Cynthia King with a forward a preface by William B. Irvine, who I've read some of his stuff before. Enjoying this a, a lot. This is relatively short, but really good. Um, so yeah, I'm reading that. Um, so let's see what I'm going to be reading next. Let's let the universe decide. Uh, I've only got three works left on my must-read list, so what will be next is... Born on a Tuesday. Born on a Tuesday. Yeah, L. Nathan John. This is a, uh, L. Nathan John is a writer from, um, I think it's Nigeria. Let me just pull up um, the blurb here. It says, from two-time Kane Prize finalist L. Nathan John, a dynamic voice from Nigeria. Born on a Tuesday is a stirring, starkly rendered first novel about a young boy struggling to find his place in a society that is fracturing along religious and political lines. Um, so this is kind of a street boy um, goes and gets involved with a local mosque and um, then I think he ultimately is faced with some decisions about what type of a person he wants to be and what type of Muslim he wants to be. That's my understanding of it. Um, I heard about this on the Neil Griffiths channel last year. I think it was Neil Griffiths. And uh, so I'm looking forward to uh, to getting this read. So this will be coming up after I finish uh, the lectures and sayings of Musonius Rufus. So until next time, take care. Bye.